This episode is brought to you by Morty, Rizova, Recon, and Patreon supporters like you. Supporting our sponsors supports our work. This year, we're hosting Recon, the reality escape convention virtually, so that we can bring our entire global community together. Our team has decided to alternate one year in person, one year virtual, and this year we are doing it online. We have one game this year. We've commissioned it from Mark Larson, who created Escape from Escape Island for Recon two years ago, and that game was a delight. He is once again back and blending a little bit of Escape Room Insider design along with some silly and playful game elements. It's gonna be a blast. Recon has a variety of ticket types to meet your needs, and the basic ticket is free. No tricks. We want our global community at Recon, and we hope to see each and every one of you there August 19th and 20th, 2023. You can learn more at realityescapecon.com. Details in the show notes. Tickets are on sale now. Welcome to the Reality Escape Pod, your lifeline when you need to get away from the real world. I'm David Spira, alongside my co-host, PG Law. Together, we're exploring immersive gaming from all angles, and we'll be joined by guests who really know their stuff. Today's episode is episode 50. Woo! It's just going to be PG and I. Hey, PG. <laughs> hey, David. It's us. We're the guests who really know their stuff. Yeah, we've learned a few things over 50 episodes. I would hope so. <laughs> no, honestly, I feel like I have learned and grown so much over the course of this podcast. And honestly, it's all thanks to the really incredible guests we've managed to have on. I fully agree. I'll also say there's some thanks to you also. You've definitely been a great partner to have along this journey. Oh, I appreciate that, David. Well, I mean, are we, is this going to be another love fest uh, where we just give a lot of compliments to each other? Because I'm OK with that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have some compliments in preparation for this. I did a thing that I have not done before, and that was I went back and I re-listened to the first two episodes. Oh, no. Was it painful? I feel like it's the feeling I have when I go back and read some of my journals from the eighth grade, and they're so hard to read. <laughs> I'll say that it was a lot less cringy than I was expecting. And I think some of it is that through listening to myself, really listening to both of us so much through the editing process over the years, I've become a little bit more numb to the cringe factor of listening to myself. But then the other piece was that we actually did, I think, a pretty good job in those early episodes. A lot of what Reality Escape Pod is now really was there from day one. Clearly, we weren't as good at interviewing. We weren't as good at working together. But we really did have a strong foundation that we began with. And I did not hate the process of listening to those old episodes. I do want another crack at interviewing Alon because I think I could do a better job now. I think Alon would be a great candidate for a returnee, <laughs> an all-star, if you will. <laughs> I think we will have to have Alon back at some point. Yeah, especially now that we have better audio equipment also. Yes, yes. That's one of the bigger changes. But one of the questions that was burning in my mind as I was listening was, I'm curious how you feel your perspective has changed over the past 50 episodes. Oh my gosh. It's such a slow, gradual journey and it's difficult to try to pinpoint one certain thing. But I would say I've gained a better appreciation for nuance and interesting mechanics. When you've played so much now, you really kind of seek out things that are different. And 
I guess the best example would be something, I don't know, like Time Machine, which we just interviewed the guys from Not Another Escape Room for the Spoilers Club. And I think this is a really prime example of a game that doesn't have a lot of outward trappings because the set design is okay. It does look very homespun. But the mechanics that they came up with were so creative and so incredible that it's really just like a fan favorite. It's like a indie movie that, surprise, was a smash hit, even though it was made with a super low budget. I really appreciate those. I think one of my favorite things are seeing and recognizing how, as the escape room industry has matured, the way that they have stratified and started going off into different directions as people are exploring things like having actors in a room and they're going more towards immersive theater or some people have done really amazing things with tech and they're going towards more of a video game mini game model or stories with branching narratives. I think that journey has been really exciting to follow. Yeah, I definitely feel like for me, my perspective shift has come in large part from watching your perspective and watching that grow and change. Really? Yeah. (laughs) What do you even mean by that? I couldn't even tell you how my perspective has changed. So I'm really interested to hear your take on it. Going into this show, you had been around the escape room block in Southern California, but you hadn't seen the broader industry. You hadn't really played much beyond SoCal. You hadn't played in Europe. You hadn't seen a lot of these renowned games that aren't in the Southern California bubble. And for me, realizing the things you had experienced versus the things you hadn't was really eye-opening for me. It was the root of a lot of the things that I'm doing now and thinking about the talk that I'm going to be giving with Lisa at Recon this summer is really delving into a lot of ideas about what it means to be an enthusiast and a player and the different types that are out there really are stemming from an awareness that came from watching you grow from what I'm now referring to as a regional enthusiast, someone who knew a particular area really well, but didn't even realize that there were all of these other wonderful things outside of the admittedly wonderful area you live in. And seeing the way that you have realized that escape rooms can take a lot more shapes and sizes and styles and vibes than what's common in Southern California. That was really eye-opening for me. That's a fair point because I remember the day that you told me, Los Angeles is really horror-driven. And I was like, it is? I thought this was just the norm. I remember that conversation we had about regional flavors, and this was just blowing my mind. And I loved the idea of that. It was just so intriguing to me that like, Yes, of course. Duh, like a music scene. And people are really only playing locally. It's not that easy to see escape rooms from around the world. And there's so many different things to be learned from them also. But it's fun to experience the local flavor, I think. That's what makes escape room travel so enticing. For the past two years, I save up all of my money and then I go to different cities and play all the different games. And they're different, not even within different like countries, but even in the U.S., although technically we're so big, each state is basically like its own country, you know, in terms of how they do things and their regional flavors. Yeah, I very much agree with that. The other perspective that I gained from watching you and then also interviewing a number of our different guests was the realization of just how long I have been doing this. I'm in my ninth year now of running Room Escape Artist, 10 years of exploring escape rooms in general. That's insane. Sometimes I think about the podcast and I'm like, oh, we just started that this year. When I look back... Two years and 50 episodes. And I think about us doing this for two years. That seems insane to me. But I think it's also because we don't do like a weekly podcast. We do it in seasons. 
50 episodes is basically one year's worth if we had done a weekly podcast. And if we had done a weekly podcast, I'd be dead. (laughs) It also would not be at the quality that it is because I don't know if our listeners realize how much work we put into this podcast. And that's why it's impossible for it to be a weekly podcast. I listen to a lot of them now that I'm walking the dog all the time, but a lot of podcasts, they're barely edited at all. I can hear people typing on the keyboard, all the pauses. Like, I don't think they've edited anything. I think most podcasts don't have the extensive show notes that we have. It takes me almost a full day to do it. Yeah, it's a lot of work doing the show the way that we do it. And that's definitely a thing that I still very much value. I always want to have a show where our listeners feel like they're getting what's on the label and that we're not using your time in ways that isn't respectful. Well, also, what kind of hypocrites would we be if we spent this entire hour talking about improving your production value and we had really crappy production value for the podcast, right? You got to put your money where your mouth is. That's really a big part of the level of quality that Lisa and I have been striving for in the reviews, in the podcast, in Recon, in the tours, in all of the things that we do is we are critics. We are critical definitionally, but we're also very critical of ourselves. And the folks who have had the endurance to work with us as writers, as editors, as producers, they know that we are really working hard to produce the best thing that our team can with the budget that we have. And we hold ourselves to the high standard that we strive to hold others to. One of the things that I've realized through recording this is how much of an impact that I think Room Escape Artist has had on the industry. And people don't always realize, but some of the best creators out there are people that have taken your reviews and your criticisms and they have turned it into an opportunity to improve their games. They didn't get defensive. They didn't get offended. Maybe they did for a little bit in private. And then they realized that maybe you had a point and they made improvements to their games that changed it for the better. In Heiss's episode, I think that was the most apparent where he straight up told us that in several of his games, they made big changes because of your reviews. And it's funny because we were listening to this in the YouTube premiere. It was fun. There are a couple of patrons in there and we were chatting and discussing the episode while it was playing. And one of the patrons had remarked like, David, you should be charging consulting fees <laughs> for all the work you do. And your response was, I don't really want consulting fees. What I would like is for people to support us in the Patreon. And I thought that was just really telling of the community that you're trying to build. Yeah, um, it's true. I want to, as best I possibly can, remain as neutral as I possibly can. And it's hard. Money makes everything hard. And we have to work harder to figure out what our ethics are and make sure that we're walking that line comfortably and cleanly for ourselves. But it is a hard thing to do. Me and Lisa, at our core... We are still just the escape room players that we were in 2014 who really loved this stuff, wanted it to be better, wanted it to grow, wanted the companies to be more profitable. So they just keep making better and more interesting games for us to play. That was always, as I referred to it, the evil plan. And it still is. We're taking a moment to thank our sponsor, Morty. Morty is a free app for discovering, planning, tracking, and reviewing your escape rooms and other immersive social outings. And Morty is now available for all to use on its brand new web experience, in addition to its fantastic iPhone app. I believe in Morty so much that I have a stake in it as an advisor. So David, I just recently found out 
about a feature Morty offers that not many people know about. And it is the ability to upload and easily share your favorite escape room recommendations. They will provide you with a QR code and you can just share that to all of your friends without having to like type out an entire list of different rooms that you want to recommend to them. It saves you a ton of time. I mean, I know people are constantly hassling you for Southern California recommendations. So how much are you using this now? I finally typed up a whole list PG's recommendations for Southern California escape rooms, and I have separated it out by area. I have also marked whether or not it is good for couples, whether it's scary or if it's family friendly. I have all of that, and I love that I can just share it with a QR code. It's pretty cool. You can learn more at MortyApp.com slash Repod. That's R-E-P-O-D to sign up and get a special badge for our listeners. Link and details are in the show notes. So I want you to imagine that you could just wave a magic wand and wish something into existence for escape rooms. Okay. I just wanted to explore some of the wants and wishes that we could have at different stages of the escape room journey. So, for example, like what's something you wish more escape rooms would do during the booking process? Okay, well, I don't book escape rooms ever (laughs) because Lisa is the queen of the calendar. But I do have an answer for this. I truly wish that escape rooms had a better handle on their own accessibility. That at booking, it was clear if it's horror, what types of horror, what types of triggers should people worry about? If there's any kind of physical element, what are the limitations that people should be aware of? If there's flashing lights, if there's any of that kind of stuff, I really wish that the games just had a way for you to get that information up front and immediately. How about you? I wish that more companies would put pictures of their escape rooms. Just an image so I could get a sense of what the production value looks like, what the theme is. It also helps me remember if I've played this room before. You know, a lot of times there's like some generic image, maybe they got it online somewhere, some clip art, and I just I want to see what the room looks like. <laughs> Completely agree. All right. So if you could wave a wand during player check-ins and onboarding, what are some sweeping changes you wish companies would do? This is a magic wand, so it doesn't necessarily have to be practical. It could just be something we're wishing into existence. I honestly just wish that companies would figure out the leanest, cleanest, most engaging version of the intro that you can possibly do that gets us out of the intro as fast as possible. And I understand that this is a limitation of training to a certain extent, but I really wish that companies would just believe you when you said, hey, I know how to operate that lock. Please don't explain it to me. (laughs) You know what I would do? And again, this is a magic wand. I know this will not be practical for most escape rooms, but I wish the onboarding itself could just be a mini game. You have one small room sectioned off that's almost like an exploratorium museum. You go to this booth and there's a small game. It teaches you how to unlock this lock. Maybe there's a short video that as you're doing it, there's a small puzzle. There's a short video that's like two fingers worth of strength, whatever. Split that up into small clips and have them experience it as they're going around this room and practicing different locks. And they also get to practice little puzzles for people who have maybe never done an escape room. So you get a sense of what to look for, right? This would be my desire. I know it's not practical to devote the space to this, but I just feel like so many problems would be solved if we could have this one thing. (laughs) I like that a lot. Your magic wand usage is better than mine. (laughs) (laughs) I've been thinking about this a lot because I kept thinking of all of these ideas I come up with that I'm like, I don't think they'd be practical, but you know, in a magical world, why not? All right. What about in-game? My immediate answer to this is just better in-game photo ops. Just have a moment where 
player's photo is taken. You don't have to take out the camera. You don't have to do a selfie and that you deliver that photo really effortlessly, but a good photo. David stole my answer. Uh, (laughs) I was thinking about this and what I would really like is a souvenir from escape rooms. Mm -hmm. And again, I know this may not always be practical. You know, we played one escape room. If you've played it, you'll know what I'm talking about. But there's an escape room out there that you get to take a selfie in game. And I thought it was so fun. You get this in-game selfie, but it doesn't have to be a selfie. It could also be like on roller coasters where you're going down the big hill and everyone's screaming and looking crazy. I thought, wouldn't it be fun if escape rooms did jump scare photos or just something when the door opens and everyone's like, oh my God, the look of wonder and people's faces when the magic thing happens. I thought that would be a really cool thing. But beyond that overall, I just put down souvenirs You know, I was really inspired by this, thinking back to like the culinary escape rooms. I want to make something in the room that I can take home later. Maybe it's a small painting or, you know, maybe it's food or whatever it is. I just thought that would be a really fun thing. Escaparium has some new souvenirs for wardrobe for sale that uh, I might have bought one. I, to be honest, I don't even know what I spent on it because it's just going to be a line item in the very gigantic bill that they're sending us to pay for the tour. <laughs> but I'll have to show it to you later, PG. It's a bit of a spoiler, so I can't reveal what it is, but I'm very excited about this. I feel like I have a guess as to what it might be. You'll have to guess later. (laughs) (laughs) All right. And then the last one, as we're continuing on our magic genie journey, (laughs) that's really hard to say, our magic genie journey through escape rooms. What about if you could grant a wish for post games, for improving the post game experience? (laughs) You go first. (laughs) All right. I want every room to have a yay room. (laughs) And this is something that... Chris from Palace Games talked about when we did a spoilers club with him about Edison Room. Chris talks about having what he calls yay rooms. And I love that term, but it's basically after the game, it doesn't end with a game master just coming in and going, congrats. You end up in a small antechamber where there's music and lights flashing and you have a small private room for your group to celebrate in and it just ends in a really fun joyous note and it doesn't have to be joyous but it's about endings right there have been games that have ended in a small room and you have a moment of reflection i i would just like there to be a definite space created for the ending and for the players to reflect on the journey, whether it's in a joyful way or a sad way or a silly way. Like, I want some closure. I want some really good closure. It's a good wish. My wish would be that every single company has a program to try and get customers to buy their next adventure and to share with their customers that there is a larger escape room universe for them to engage in. There are other fantastic companies in their area. There are podcasts. There are things that you can engage with because there's this wonderful community out there. Because the more you get those folks engaging with our community, the more likely they're going to be back as your customers again later on. But yeah, I've said this before. I'm going to say it over and over again until it actually becomes real. Getting first-time players to become habitual players is my dream. (laughs) It's David the Pusher now. (laughs) This is something that is easily achievable, I feel like. You don't need a magic wand for that. I mean, I've been preaching it for years and it hasn't really happened. So I think I need to upgrade to a magic wand. (laughs) (laughs) Do you think that players feel like it's pushy when people are like, here's a discount for a next game, if but only if you book it now? Honestly, give them a week. It doesn't matter. The point is to get people to realize that there is more and it's worth it for them to go back. That, I think, is the real key link here that's often missing is I still meet plenty of people who have done one escape room and believe they've seen it all. And I think that breaking that illusion as quickly and as effectively as you possibly can, there's money in that. Or like having discounts if you book everything in one day or something like that. I don't know. 
having a book everything discount is probably a good idea too. I guess it just really comes down to what are you optimizing for? And I do think that like offering 5% off for people who book absolutely everything, you're making good money off of that. You know, another question to ask yourself is what are you spending on Google AdWords and Facebook ads and all of your other marketing? If you have a guaranteed customer that all you have to do is give them just a little bit off and you're making money, you're not even taking any chances. I don't understand why people aren't doing more to incentivize repeat play. I think there's just this perception of they're going to play anyway, so might as well take them for all they're worth. But you can give people a reason to play more with you for sure. Do you think it's about having the flyer culture that we have here in LA? I don't know. I mean, I kind of like the flyer culture. I also think that in some places it's a little bit invasive. If you have like a really immersive lobby, it's just not going to work. You're never going to see that at Escape My Room. I also think that I find the flyer culture of LA, there's a part of me that really likes it. There's also a part of me that finds it just excessively overwhelming. I would (laughs) honestly rather see a company go and say, hey, here are three or four companies that I think you should go and check out, rather than presenting me with this giant mess of flyers. It's kind of overwhelming. I don't know what to make of that when I look at it. I get it, but also it's like an etiquette thing. It's just flyer exchanges, right? Like You can't be like, here's mine. And they're like, well, here's mine. And then you're like, no, I only put four or five out there that I really recommend. Or you just take them and trash them. (laughs) It's a choice. I have a hypothesis that I think that the LA flyer culture has hit a point of diminishing returns. I think that there's a point in the bell curve where it's like, oh, wow, this is really cool and really wholesome. And then it becomes so much that as a customer, I used to walk into those companies and take a look at everything. But on my most recent trip, the volume of flyers that I saw, I was just like, it's just too much. I don't know how to process it. I don't know how to choose which one do I want to take. Would I want to take any? Maybe I'm so old school. I love a good flyer. But you're also talking to somebody whose high school bedroom was wallpapered in like rave flyers. This used to be a whole thing. We used to collect (laughs) Ray flyers, all the coolest ones. I'd put them all up over my room. They're still up, actually. Like I have photos of them from like 97. But I'm also one of those people that when I walk into like a two star motel that has the little shelf of pamphlets of local attractions, you know what I'm talking about at the end of the hallway. And I just love going there and looking through all of them because. Those are the local attractions, like the local weird roadside attractions and weird little museums and things like that. When you're in the hotel lobby and you see that whole array of different flyers, there's a bunch of different things for different people. If you want to go on a hike, you go here. If you want to go whitewater rafting, you go here. If you want to go to an art museum, here's three art museums. If you want to go to a children's museum, that's there. All that stuff, you can kind of like skim over that and zero in very quickly and be like, I want to go rafting. And then you go and grab that. There aren't 40 rafting companies and you're standing there looking at the flyers going and figuring out, well, which one am I going to take? Which is what I think is happening with the escape room flyers taken to a different extreme. That's a fair point. They're not necessarily categorized. Maybe if they were grouped geographically or something, (laughs) that would be helpful. (laughs) Yeah. There's a lot of different ways it could be done. But I think that ultimately, it's sort of like if this company is a fan of that work or if it's something like if you like the games we're making, you should check out these people also. There's something a little bit more to it. It feels a little bit more personal and a little bit more authentic to me when a company is recommending a couple of other companies that they like rather than it's impolite for me to not advertise for literally everyone. And if I don't advertise for them, they won't advertise for me. So we're just all locked in this giant reciprocal system where everyone is just devoting an increasingly large table to (laughs) flyers. I think it's more meaningful. I think that like everything can be plotted on a bell curve. And I think that too little support for your local community is bad. But I'm also, on my last trip to LA, started thinking maybe there is such a thing as too much. 
<laughs> That's a fair point. And I know quite a few owners that also will only ask to do flyer exchanges with companies that they do enjoy, right? And so that's how you limit it. That's sort of my thought. I do think it's a start. I mean, LA has grown to the point where it's saturated, but like as you've pointed out to me, not a lot of other communities have that flyer exchange. So that may be a place to start for those companies that don't have it at all. Yeah, I think it is in general a lovely thing, but I think that it's crossed a threshold where, in my opinion, a little bit more intentionality behind it will give it better results. It'll certainly make it more interesting for me as a customer. That's a good point. I'm glad you ended on a note that is actually actionable or maybe a little bit more practical than some of our other wishes. (laughs) (laughs) Resova is your all-in-one, all-inclusive software for bookings made specifically with escape rooms in mind. Incorporating community-driven features, it's designed to follow the guest journey from selecting times to book, waiver management, integrated point of sale system, and follow-up emails. Resova is the ultimate online reservation software designed to elevate the guest experience, increase game master efficiency, drive sales, and improve operations. PG, what is fantastic about Resova is that they offer something for the owners, something for the guests, and something for the GMs. What does Resova offer the guests? As an escape room enthusiast, as a guest, what I care about in my guest experience is increased convenience. And Rosova can do that for you. First of all, they have full integration with Morty. That means that escape rooms can offer their booking times on Morty, and that's how I tend to use it the most. I want as few clicks as possible to get from me finding your escape room to me playing your escape room. And less clicks means it's easier to book. That means more revenue for you. I also like that it automates emails, reminding me of my bookings. It sends follow-up emails asking how it did, if I want to leave a review. It's just really useful and convenient for me as a guest. And that's what you want if you want guests to come back and play all of your other rooms. To learn more, get a free demo, and find out how easy Rizova can make your transition to their technology, head over to rizova.com slash rea and be sure to use our link or drop our name because as a thank you to Repod listeners, Rizova is offering up to $100 in Google AdWords when you sign up through our link. Details in the show notes. We have a few messages that some of our past guests have left for us for episode 50. I'm going to start off with Tommy Haunton, the owner of Stash House, and creator of many games that you might not realize he's involved in. Tommy was on Season 3, Episode 7. Let's hear his message. Hey, PG and David, it's Tommy Fonton calling. I just wanted to say a sincere congratulations on 50 episodes. You uh, have made a very compelling show that is really, really solid and nothing but neat. The editing process you go through makes anyone sound good, me included. So I want to thank you for creating a distilled, smart, engaging conversation that I think captures the aspects of design in this space in such a compelling way. The questions you ask, the humor, the heart of this whole thing, I'm insanely impressed. And every episode adds another dimension to that. So I'm honored to be part of this community and honored to have been part of your 50. So thank you. And I look forward to the next 50. And all the humor and laughs. Tommy, thank you. It means a lot that he notices the humor in the podcast because I think we work really hard to kind of inject it into topics that can get a little bit serious sometimes. And honestly, half of our friendship is just basically me trying to make him laugh over and over. So appreciate that. (laughs) Yeah, I really appreciate everything that Tommy's saying there. I just feel like he sees the show for what we're trying to make and that feels really good and yeah we are in a comedy show but as our tagline has always been reasonably humorous 
I like to make sure that there's at least a little bit of it. <laughs> yeah. And it's cool that he mentioned that he still learns things from the episodes because he's so accomplished and he's like done so much. But that's one of the things I've realized is some of the best designers out there are just they're never done learning. They're always trying to get more and more. I mean, it's a bottomless pit of knowledge to learn because there's so many different things that can be a factor in producing experiences. Basically, anything can be. And I think back to like one of the riskier episodes we recorded was when we had Johanna Kolyonin on talking about LARP in season three, episode two. I think that was the pitch that I made that you were most resistant to back when we were planning that season. And I just said, look, we're just going to do this. If it falls apart, it's on me. There have definitely been a couple of episodes like that that didn't quite go the way we were hoping to. And almost all of them were episodes I wanted to make. So I wasn't opposed to falling on my face. Was I resistant? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You were like LARP. LARP is really the deep end, David. Oh, uh, you know what? I've erased all memory of that from, <laughs> from my brain. I'm like, of course, that sounds amazing. What are you talking about? Over the course of the episode, you went from being like, really, to the entire bonus episode is basically, I'm barely there. The entire bonus episode is you asking Johanna basically all of the questions that I was asking her when I first met her, and she blew my mind. <laughs> You know, this is something that I really appreciated with Johanna was that she was talking about a topic that not a ton of people have a lot of knowledge on this very specific style of Nordic LARP. But she came with a lot of definitions of things. And then she would give really concrete examples. And so for me, that's how I learn a lot of times is let me give you an example of what I meant by this. My favorite one was when she talked about designing a party, the whole everything is a designable surface. And a lot of these things are kind of intuitive. Oh, you make a dance floor dark. People hang out in the kitchen and you feel like you know this. But for her to really break it down and explain why those are the areas that are good for those activities. I love when guests give really concrete examples that help us wrap our minds around these concepts that they're explaining. Yeah, yeah, I most certainly agree. Should we listen to another one? Yes. We have Alexander Gearholtz from Logic Locks in the Netherlands. Alexander was on season four, episode four. Happy anniversary, David and PG. And get ready to have your audio quality downgraded with this uh, recording from Alexander Gearholtz from Amsterdam. <laughs> You asked what a few things that I learned on Report and see, I learned from Brian Corbett that escape rooms need more puppets. And I learned that maybe being an independent designer can be more satisfying and more inspiring than working at a shiny and prestigious company such as Disney. Thank you for that, uh, Tommy Hunton. Also, I learned that someone actually made a business out of designing games and experiences for just one person or couples. Shout out to Chris Waters, I love your work. I also learned that nobody in my house wants to watch Survivors, which is a bit disappointing as um, I did enjoy uh, PG stories and uh, nevertheless don't really feel like watching the show by myself. It's such a joy to listen to uh, People like PG and David and their guests express truly authentically their passion and enthusiasm for this industry. And it really helps to listen to this when uh, you have moments in which you feel maybe a bit demotivated or frustrated with uh, the everyday things that you have to deal with when uh, you run a business. Also, there are so many podcasts out there in which you have to listen to two to three hour long conversations to get to like 15 or 20 minutes of interesting nuggets. Um, this is not the case with Report. Here you don't have to do all this work because uh, David is doing it for you. David is doing all sorts of uh, research and asking truly thoughtful and interesting questions that lead to really fascinating conversations in most of the time under one hour. So uh, thank you very much for that. 
and uh, I'm looking forward to all the episodes that are still to come. Oh, Alexander, God, what a sweetheart. <laughs> yeah, that's the first time I'm hearing that one. Also, most of these I haven't had a chance to listen to, and I'm definitely choking up. Um, <laughs> okay, that's. I was like, David looks like he's about to cry. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> Thank you, Alexander. Truly. Wow, Alexander. Yeah. David, you know, David started crying earlier in this episode than I expected. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The thing that he said there that really is to me the most important part of this show is that it is so much work and so much of the day to day of running an escape room isn't realizing the magic that you have created and being able to reflect back to creators what is so amazing about their work. And sometimes you can hear them in our episode realizing that their work, in fact, is amazing and things that to them were just normal are remarkable. That has been one of the most special parts of creating this show for me. And it's really what I have always wanted from day one. I did not want a show about me and I wanted a show about the guests. It's cool to hear that it feels like that's coming through. Yeah, I always feel really blessed that we get to talk about an industry and celebrate these creators that are fueled by passion. This is what they really love doing. And it's a funny thing that when people are doing things that they love doing, a lot of times they don't feel like they deserve to get paid for it. I love this. I'm having a great time doing this. It's almost like they feel bad taking money. I don't know. It's a weird thing. And then the other thing is this imposter syndrome that a lot of them have. And I'm like, you guys are doing the work of 10 companies as a single escape room operator, creator, designer. You've got to do the technology, your writing, you're a magician, you're designing puzzles, you're acting. It's honestly insane when I think about the number of hats that escape room creators have to put on. And so I definitely appreciate that part of what we get to do here on this podcast is to celebrate these people and all the hard work they've put into creating something that's bringing so much joy to me and all of our listeners. Should we listen to Chris Waters? Let's do it. Chris Waters, the architect of Constructed Adventures. If you want to listen to his episode, he was on season three, episode eight. Hey, Repod team. This is Chris Waters, the architect from Constructed Adventures. First and foremost, I just want to wish you guys a happy 50th. Uh, congratulations. You're wonderful. Really, one of the things that, that sticks out to me about this podcast is it's it's kind of the only podcast really in this industry that does what it does. And so it could go in any direction, but instead you go with this Sean Evans Hot Ones style investigative journalism, taking a deep dive into your guests' lives and asking them questions that not only had they never heard before, but also were completely unprepared for. Um, that definitely happened to me, and I can kind of hear it happen with, with other interviews as well. And so kudos, kudos to going that extra mile, despite the fact that there uh, is not as many people doing what you're doing, you're still holding yourselves to an incredibly high standard. So thank you so much for what you do and cheers to the next 50. Thanks, Chris. God, I love Chris. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when I hit him up to send in a voicemail, he sent me a photo of him with this gigantic cat. And he was like, I can't move right now because I have a cat on me, <laughs> but I will as soon as this cat allows me to. <laughs> <laughs> I know that Chris studied broadcast journalism in college and he really knows his way around an interview. He definitely gets what we're going for. That surprise, that lack of preparation from the guests is something that we like. It's something that we value. It allows us to get really honest, open interviews. And I just really love the feeling of surprising and delighting someone with a question, it feels almost like a superpower. When you ask someone the right question, you find the thing that really excites them that no one ever asks them about. It feels so delightful. And that's a gift that I love to be able to give. 
I really love what Chris said about learning about the backgrounds and backstories of a lot of our guests. And I thought it would be kind of, I don't know, boring, but it has been so fascinating to see how a lot of these creators' backgrounds have informed their design style. Like, for example, again, when we interviewed Heist from Dark Park, you know, I mentioned how his jump scares felt like a misdirection. And he was like, oh, by the way, I used to be a magician. <laughs> and I was like, da doy. Now it, it makes total sense. So that has been a really fun thing for me is seeing what these guys did in their previous lives and how it has informed their style as an escape room designer. Yeah, I agree. Next up, we have Ann and Chris Lukeman, the owners of CU Adventures through Time and Space in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. They were some of our earliest guests, season one, episode four, Early Darlings. That episode was super popular because they are incredibly engaging. And they're also going to be speaking at Recon this year. Hi, folks. This is Chris and Ann Lukeman from CU Adventures. We just wanted to call and say thank you. Without this podcast and without Room Escape Artist, we really wouldn't be where we are today. Y'all, having us on Repod helped us get through the pandemic and honestly changed the trajectory of our business and our lives. And listening to the amazing conversations with guests like Nick Moran and Tommy Haunton has given us the confidence and the inspiration to jump into our next big thing. We're so grateful for everything that you do. Congrats on 50 episodes, and we can't wait to see you at Recon Digital later this year. David, can I tell you that when they sent me this file, it was named Audio Message Luke Men, M-E-N. Like, <laughs> I love how they pluralized their last name because it was both of them on it. That is adorable, which is really on brand because they're just so adorable. <laughs> and he was like, we also slipped way into our radio broadcaster voice, which we just can't help <laughs> when we're on in message. And I was like, please do. <laughs> yeah, it works. I got nothing to add. I just thank you. And you should definitely be coming to Recon this summer. It is virtual and they are going to be delivering a wonderful talk. So I think you're going to want to be a part of that. We have one last message from Jonathan Driscoll of Escaparium in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Jonathan was on season four, episode five with his partner, Sasha St. Dennis. Greetings, my fine feathered friends. This is Jonathan Driscoll calling in to say a few words about this awesome podcast. Uh, first of all, as an owner, I feel like I learn a little something every episode. It's hard to go back and remember every little detail, but there's a lot of little things we learn that gets our gears turning, and we try to see how it applies to us and our guests' experiences. One of the most important things I've personally learned is that we can't please everyone, and we shouldn't try. I remember a recent guest once said that if 95% of the people love our experience, but 5% hate them, that's perfect. And I think that as an owner in any industry, this is something very important to realize and accept. Something I've really enjoyed, sorry, enjoying might be a bad word for this example, <laughs> but is that everyone makes mistakes. Hearing that others make mistakes and admitting it, then talking about their experience and that not everything is always sunshine and rainbows is great to hear as an owner and as a human being. Mistakes are what allow us to grow, to become better, it can be very difficult to deal with at times, but it's something we must deal with, and hearing others talk about them somehow makes it easier on us to deal with our own mistakes. I enjoy how much thought and time are put into the questions and discussion topics when it comes to the guests, but I also really, really enjoy how the bonus episodes are more open conversations with David and PG, and most of the time the guests. I look forward to every Monday. And between seasons, I normally go back and listen to previous seasons. Um, from the bottom of my heart, thanks to both of you and your team, Steve and Lisa, for putting on such a great podcast that I truly enjoy and value. Farewell and stay classy, San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> I love Jonathan. <laughs> Yeah, same. What did he keep calling at Recon? Was it Birds he, of a Feather? He was calling the Birds of a Feather sessions Birds of Prey, which <laughs> I do believe is where the Fine Feathered Friends reference is coming from. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I love how every message that came in, they talked about something different. I was a little worried they were all going to say the same thing, but they all said something totally different. And I like that he pointed out the conversations we had where the guests talk about mistakes or failures. I thought that was an interesting point. Yeah, that was something that we slowly started to introduce in the early days. I wanted to ask more questions about it, but I didn't feel established enough to confidently ask those questions. Also, in the early days, it was during quarantine and we were trying to focus on the positive, I think. That is very true. Over time, we started to realize that so much of the most fascinating conversation and human conversations that we could have were about things that went wrong. And seeing the effect that has had on our community has also been wonderful, particularly Lucas's interview from last season, which was season four, episode 11, Lucas from Crime Runners. That was a really heartfelt episode. And the number of people who wrote in to tell us the positive effect that that episode had on them in making them feel less alone, that really is profound. And it's something we're trying to steer more towards as we continue to iterate and grow and record new episodes. Yeah. Everybody has imposter syndrome in this industry. Yeah. And on the subject of Jonathan and his team learning and iterating, Oh my, is that true? I just came back from running our Montreal tour. It was our second tour there. And the amount that Escaparium has grown, not just since the last time we were there, I've been to his places now on four different trips. And each time it is like a meteoric leap. And this most recent trip, they opened Forgotten Cathedral. That's their newest game. And it is breathtaking. That's all I'm going to say. I'm so excited. I'm going this summer to go play. And we'll be chatting about David's Montreal trip a little bit more in the bonus episode. So you could stay tuned and hear his thoughts on that. For sure. That is it for our voicemails. PG, you made us a game. I did. So we have our spoilers club. These are episodes that we've created for patrons that are coming in at the $15 tier or higher. And we invite the creators of really iconic classic escape rooms to come on and give us a behind the scenes walkthrough of their game. So you can revisit your favorite escape rooms and the creators will give us some special behind the scenes looks. They'll talk about places where the games didn't always work out the way they did, you know, and it's really special content. I basically made this game to celebrate some of the games that we have covered in the Spoilers Club. So this game is called Escape the Rhyme. The way this game works is I have taken the titles of escape rooms that we've covered for our Spoilers Club episodes. I have changed one word of the title to something that rhymes with that word. I have then created a new description of the game based on that new title. And you will tell me the title of this new escape room. I'll give you an example. Okay. Okay. So if I were to say in this game, you're exiting the same door over and over again, emerging into new rooms where you are suddenly deluged by an oozing goo, you would say slime machine. Okay. (laughs) Because the escape room I'm referencing was time time machine, machine. and I've changed time to slime, so the new room is slime machine. Okay. In this game, you're on a Goonies-style adventure when you suddenly stumble upon the local pub. This is Cutthroat Cavern. Uh Uh-huh. And we're in a pub. Cutthroat Tavern. Ding! It is Cutthroat Tavern. (laughs) All right. In this game, you're earning your way into a local crew by breaking everything in their home. Okay, so this is Stash House. And we're breaking everything in their home. Trash House? Close. Crash house? You know what? I feel like I could accept all of these. 
the title that I had was Smash House. (laughs) Ah, yes. Okay, cool. All right. In this game, you consult a medium to discover what happened to your favorite piece of cookware. Okay, so this is Strange Bird Immersive's The Man From Beyond. Yes. The Pan From Beyond? The Pan From Beyond. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) In this next game, you are shepherded through a fancy dinner by a very mean nobleman eating as quickly as you can. So this is the Last Supper from Quest Tavern. So we've got a mean host and we're eating quickly. So Fast Supper? Fast Supper. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) It is not Last Supper. It's Fast Supper. All right. A voyeuristic creature saves us from a misguided mushroom in this musical romp. Okay, so this is the keeper and the fungus among us. The peeper and the fungus among us. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. This is peeper and the fungus among us. Like, how I always like laugh at my own games. <laughs> so, so amused by them. <laughs> All right, David, we just got a few more. In this wearable game, you're trying to figure out the correct frequency. Wearable game? Come on, David. How many games have been wearable? Oh, gosh. Okay. So this is um, Solve Our Shirts. Yes. I got nothing. This is a really, really tough one. It is Solve Our Hurts. Oh, gosh. (laughs) Deep cut. In this last one, I have changed all the words in the title to something that rhymes, but they both only have two words in the title. In this highly immersive game, you're separated into two rooms in the beginning, but eventually come together. So you can figure out the family's secret recipe for detergent. I'm trying to think of what split start games we've done spoilers clubs for. Okay, so this is Hope End by the Ministry of Peculiarities. Family's secret recipe for detergent. Soap. (laughs) Yeah. This one's a little bit tricky. Oh, (laughs) soap blend. (laughs) PG, these were great. Thank you. (laughs) So that was my game. And if you guys enjoyed this, I hope you will join us for the bonus episodes and for our spoilers club. All right. So let's bring this thing in for a closing. We've got a couple questions just to consider. PG, I'm curious, what has this journey meant for you? What are you most proud of through your podcasting journey over the last 50 episodes? Wow, that's a lot to try to encompass. I can start with what I'm most proud of. There's several things. I guess I'm pretty proud of the ideas I had for the bonus episodes and the Spoilers Club, which I think have probably been my two biggest contributions conceptually I agree. You have been a mighty force on both of those. I was a (laughs) spoilers club and bonus episode skeptic, and you have proven me very wrong. I really like how all three shows are very different from each other. They're same, same, but different. They're the same because it's us. Yeah, no, they do have different purpose and intent and tone and just a whole different vibe about them. And Figuring out what each one was together has really been a fun experience. Yeah, that's been really fun. And I think also just seeing my own improvement as an interviewer, because I I know how to be a good podcast guest, tell the stories, bring the energy. But I think there is really an art form to asking the questions that you've always been really good at. And I never felt like that was really my forte. I was idiot sidekick, you know, just asked the really obvious follow up questions. But I do feel like listening to myself through these past couple seasons, I think I've gotten a lot better at crafting really good follow up questions and kind of getting the guests to give us those concrete examples, which I really enjoy and that I think really help underline and illustrate the points that they're trying to make. I completely agree. I think. That's what I'm most proud of you for also. (laughs) 
I, for me, the thing that I think I'm most proud of is the way that you and I collaborate this silent dance that happens in Google Docs while we're interviewing. It's like the Vulcan mind meld. (laughs) Yeah. The way that we're just adapting on the fly and we have this weird language of bolds and highlights and it's a really funny thing that evolved organically and I find the act of creating together through that very satisfying. Yeah, it feels almost like a magic trick and it all just works. And a lot of times the episodes flow much better because we're able to adapt on the fly. So David has a whole list of prepared questions and the order that he wants to answer them in. But the guest journey takes unexpected directions sometimes. And so we end up jumping around in ways that try to make the episode flow in a more logical way. I think maybe one episode has ever gone to plan where we went question one all the way through to the end in the exact order that I had predicted. Yeah. Yeah. Because the truth about this kind of interviewing is that it's fluid. It's a little bit of playing with fire. You don't really know how it's going to react. PG and I have a plan and an approach, but the guest does what the guest does. And reacting to that in real time is so much better than trying to force the guest onto the trail you want them to be on. I agree. It's been an absolute pleasure working on this with you, David. I mean, it's been a ton of work, but I have really felt very fulfilled by my work on this podcast. Very much the same. When we first started doing this, We barely knew each other and it felt like a completely insane thing to go and create a podcast with someone that I barely knew. (laughs) And (laughs) over the course of the past 50 episodes, plus all the bonuses and spoilers clubs and all of the travel we've done together, you've really become one of the most important people in my life. And I just really treasure the whole experience. David, thanks. I love these discussions. I think it's really helped. I think much more critically about escape rooms a lot in a large part because of the discussions that we have. And I'm glad that we're able to share this with our listeners. I very much agree. (laughs) And honestly, I do want to take this time also to give a really heartfelt thanks and appreciation to you, our listeners, because you guys have really made this possible for us. You have embraced this podcast. We love hearing the feedback. I love when people comment on the episodes. I love reading all the reviews that you guys leave for us. David will screenshot and send them to us. And it just means so much to us to know that you like what we're doing and you support us. Truly, thank you to everyone who has supported us along the way with a five star on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, a back on Patreon, or even just a like or a share on social media. These things are huge. We say it in every single episode. And the hardest part for us at this point is growing the audience. We figured out how to make the content. We are always working on getting better at it, but we're pretty good at it at this point. The hardest part for us truly is getting the financial support and getting more listeners. And we're going to keep working on that. But if you ever listen to an episode and you think, I really like what they're doing and you want to help us out in the smallest of ways, any one of those things, a couple bucks, a five-star review, a share on social media, or telling a friend about the show. Those things are so incredibly valuable to us. So thank you to everyone who has done any volume of those. Yeah, word of mouth means a lot. All right. PG, thank you for joining me on this adventure. Here's to 50 more. Woohoo! 50 more, 50,000 more. (laughs) (laughs) Let's get to 100 first. Is he David? Start sweating. <laughs> the Reality Escape Pod is produced by Lisa Spira, edited by Steve Ewing of Stand Inside Media, music by Ryan Elder of RyanElderMusic.com, 
and brought to you by RoomEscapeArtist.com, your home for well-researched, rational, and reasonably humorous escape room and immersive gaming content and events. If you have been enjoying this podcast, we would really appreciate a five-star rating and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. It doesn't cost you anything, but it really helps us spread the word about Reality Escape Pod. Thank you to our highest level Patreon backers. Breakout Games, Derek Tam, Olivier Escape, Escapism, Escaparium, Panic Room, Byron Delmonico, Josh Rosenfeld, Paula Swan, Rex Miller, Scott Olson, and the Ministry of Peculiarities. Thank you all so much for your ongoing support. It's April of 2015. The escape room community is barely a thing, if it even is a thing. And a woman named Amanda has sent me an email saying that she really liked escape rooms. Another escape room owner said that she should reach out to me. And so we made plans to meet up for the gigantic scrap game that they were hosting in a minor league ballpark on Staten Island. Lisa and I got stuck in a ton of traffic while we were trying to get there because the bridge we were supposed to take was closed, adding over an hour to our trip. We finally get to the minor league ballpark. We get checked into the game. They are already doing the intro for this experience that many people are playing. And I am on the phone, running onto the field with Lisa, trying to find our teammates who we never met, Amanda Harris and Drew Nelson, who are then and still to this day, some of the most experienced escape room players in the world. We find them, we barely exchange pleasantries, we just start puzzling. And this is back in the day where it was not normal for escape room players to meet one another. We puzzle our hearts out and at the end of all of this, we're going back to the car and Amanda and Drew are trying to call an Uber. I ask where they're going to go and they tell me that they're going all the way out to the far end of Long Island to play an escape room. I asked them, do you know how much that Uber is going to cost? And they said, no. I said, it's going to cost a fortune. Do you want teammates? And they said, sure. Do you want to get in our car? We'll drive you. They said, sure. And so these strangers piled into these other stranger's car. We all drove out to this game. We beat it in about 20 minutes. We played very well together. The owner was uncomfortably humiliated. And then Lisa and I drove them back to New York to their hotel. And they have been some of our closest friends ever since. <laughs>